Okay, so today uh, the plan is to sort of ping pong a bit between the more applied and more theoretical aspects of mechanism design and what we've been talking about. I want to begin the lecture with one final point on last week's topic. Last week's topic was revenue maximization uh, in single parameter environments. So last week on Monday, we covered something very fundamental, Meyerson's theory uh, of optimal auctions based on virtual surplus maximization. Then on Wednesday, we talked about much more recent results. We talked about guar approximation guarantees for much simpler uh, auctions. And we also talked about prior independent auctions, auctions that do uh, almost as well as if you know the distribution, even though their description cannot reference the distribution. So what I wanted to say one final thing about is, okay, so we've learned all of this theory, so how does this, how does this actually get applied? So I want to say a little bit um, as a case study about some work that was done uh, by Michael Ostrowski, who's a professor here in the business school, um, and Michael Schwartz. This is a working paper from 09. I'll put a link up to it on the, uh, on the course website. And this is a field study. So they were working for Yahoo, and they were trying to be smart about setting reserve prices uh, in keyword auctions at Yahoo. Okay. Really smarter than they'd been uh, in the past. And by a keyword auction, I just mean a sponsored search auction, same thing. Okay? Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, hmm, 2008, 2009, researchers give Yahoo some advice. What's happened since then? But, uh, don't blame Ostrowski and Schwartz. I mean, this is, this is good work. So you'll, the, the worst days at Yahoo actually coincided with basically not having a research group. So uh, I'll tell you more about the impact of their work in a second. OK. So one thing I'm asking you to verify on the exercise set is that at least in theory, if you want to do revenue maximization in a keyword auction, it's as straightforward as some of the other simplest examples that we've seen, at least if the bidders have evaluations drawn IID from a regular distribution. So very much in the spirit of a single item auction. So if you have bidders, and remember in keyword auctions, the valuation is per click. So if those valuations per click are IID from a regular distribution, meaning the virtual value function is increasing, so with a single item auction, we observe that this is a, a great exhibit A for auction theory. We get that the Vickery auction with a suitable reserve price is optimal. Here we get that the natural extension, the rank by bid um, allocation rule, again with a suitable reserve price, the same reserve price and monopoly price is the optimal auction once coupled with um, suitable, uh, suitable payments. So in theory, if I told you this regular distribution of bidders were ID, you would know exactly what to do to maximize revenue. So Ostrowski and Schwartz said, well, let's look at what Yahoo's actually doing and compare it to the theory. And if it deviates from the theory, bring it closer to the theory and see if Yahoo actually does better, if it actually does make more money. So what were they doing? Well, they were using unusually low reserve prices compared to what the theory says. So in the earliest days, the reserve price was just a penny. Then later they raised it to a nickel. And then at the time the study was then 2008, they'd raised it to a dime. Perhaps uh, more curiously, this reserve price was used across different keywords. Okay, so remember how it works in these keyword auctions. The user types in some query into a search engine, and then the advertisers who actually care about people searching for that term, they're the ones that participate in the auction. So of course the participants in one of these auctions is different if someone's sta searching for station wagon than if they're searching for camera. Okay? And you might think that you know, maybe some search terms involve auctions where the valuation distribution is rather different than for other keywords. 
So maybe people searching for a divorce, divorce lawyer, maybe typical valuations per click there might be different than when the keyword is pizza, for example. Okay. So that was what was in place when this study was done. And so here was the field experiment that they did. It's, I mean, in some ways it's very straightforward, but I want to tell you about it. Um, so they said, well, you know, what would the theoretical optimal be, first of all? Question? So, you know, of course, Yahoo gave them past bidding data. They studied roughly a half a million keywords. So they saw a history of bids on each of these 500,000 keywords over some period of time. From that, they proposed, they sort of fit distributions to them. And that was a bit ad hoc, but there's no real evidence that it mattered which distribution they used. So they fit log normal distributions uh, to the past data. And of course, for, they did this separately for each keyword. Okay, so they got a different valuation distribution for each different keyword, depending on the bids on that keyword in the past. And so then they did something which all of you are now in a position to do, which is once you have the distributions, what's the optimal reserve? You all know that's the monopoly price. That's a calculation any of you could carry out. It did indeed vary with the keyword. For some, the theoretically optimal reserve price was low. For others, it was high. But for many, many keywords, it was considerably higher than the baseline 10% that Yahoo was using across the board. Okay, they ranged as high as like a buck, but seeing 20, 30, 40 cents was not very uncommon. Okay, so two to four X theoretical suggested increase was reasonably common. So then, for these keywords where the theoretically optimal reserve price was higher, the obvious thing to do was to raise it, see if it gets better, okay, to check the theory. So that's what they did. Now, the, the Yahoo top brass, they wanted to be a little conservative. They didn't just want to sort of run wild, you know, and, uh, and immediately switch to the theoretical prediction. So they took the midpoint. They said, well, you know, if the theoretical optimal reserve is 40 cents, let's just average that with the old one, 10 cents. <coughs> let's just bump it up to 25 cents, okay? So that's what they did. So, oh, sorry, new reserve is the average of the old one, which was 10 cents, plus the optimal one. One sort of lesson learned from this study, which is kind of cool, which is that in both practice and in theory, you get the most gains in revenue from this sort of initial increase. So once the reserve gets pretty close to the optimal one, raising it that final bit doesn't really change the revenue very much. Okay, so the biggest gains are from the initial increase if the reserve price is way too low. So even though you know, the, the reason was maybe conservatism, this is actually a, a well-justified uh, maneuver. Okay, so what happened? Well, it worked. So the revenue, you know, it varied a little bit keyword by keyword, but overall the revenue went up by several percent. So, you know, it might sound sort of modest, several percent, but remember this is several percent of like a really large number. So this was a big deal. And uh, it was especially effective in some sense where you'd expect it to be competitive, uh, effective, which is keywords which were not uh, sorry, you'd expect it, it was effective in, in keyword markets, which on the one hand, uh, there was actually value there, so there were people willing to pay for those clicks, and secondly, there weren't a lot of bidders. It wasn't very competitive, okay? And if you think about it, this is where you'd expect reserve prices to matter the most, because remember, the reserve price raises your payment exactly when there's precisely one bid above your reserve. Okay, otherwise it just defaults to the usual surplus maximizing auction. Think about a single item auction, right? If you get two bids above the reserve, it's as if the reserve was zero, it doesn't matter. Okay, so if I increase the competition, you have lots of bidders, it's more and more likely you'll see two or more people above the reserve price. So reserves are really important in thinner markets where you don't have a lot of bidders. Okay, so especially, so I'm gonna put it on the exercise set, the next one, 
for you to think about, you know, give me some examples of keywords that might simultaneously be valuable. There'd be people who'd be willing to pay for those clicks, but also you might have, say, at most six, you might think, advertisers bidding in the auction. Okay, and here, here, by, here by small, I mean, let's say at most, at most six. Okay. So this was cool. So in the, in the, the Yahoo president's uh, third quarter report in 2008, um, she was talking about you know, how the company was doing, and they had had this growth in uh, search revenue, and she cited better reserve pricing strategies as the, probably the dominant factor in that revenue increase. So it was a big deal for Yahoo at the time. Question? Good question, good question. Right, so those of you who are doing the problem sets know that there's this thing called the generalized second price auction. That was problem, I forget, three maybe, uh, on the first problem set. And indeed, Yahoo was not using um, the DSIC payments. They were using the sort of next slot, uh, general GSP type payments. Now, so it doesn't require much of a, of a it doesn't ch require changing the story much. Because while we said, and what I'm asking you to prove on the exercise set, uh, is that if you want the optimal DSIC auction, then you should you know, use the Meyerson payment rule. But in fact, you can do exactly the same exercise you did for GSP in the presence of a monopoly, in the presence of a reserve price. And you get that there's always this full, full information equilibria, which mimics what would be the dominant strategy outcome uh, in the Meyerson optimal auction. So the bidders have to work a little bit harder to shade their bids just right. But if you believe in that equilibrium of GSP, even with a reserve price, you actually will have optimal revenue uh, at that equilibrium. And in fact, I mean, if you read the paper, that's what they do. Okay. And so then, um, yeah. And so in particular, when they have to back out the valuation distributions, they do not assume that bids are truthful bids. So they assume bidders are actually at that e equilibrium of the GSP auction. From that, they reverse engineer their values, and then because you can use that same recurrence to back out their values from their bids, and then you can actually fit the distributions to it. That's a good question. Question. So, uh, so you don't know people's values, so it's not clear how to check that. Yeah. So I mean, you can do sanity checks. So you can do things like, well, here's a set of bids that are clearly not at any equilibrium, whatever the values. And people have certainly done those studies at length in GSP. And yeah, you know, I'm not sure what rule of thumb to tell you. I mean, the equilibrium analysis is useful. I mean, it does help you think about the problem properly. But it's also, there's also non-trivial deviations from the equilibria quite commonly. OK, any other questions? All right, then if not, the, the, the middle part of the class is going to be uh, fairly abstract. And then we'll jump back to another case study. All right, so for the first time, I want to move beyond these single parameter environments that we've been talking about. Okay, so in a single parameter environment, you might recall, the reason they're simple is that from each bidder's perspective, all you have is one private piece of information, your value for stuff. Okay, you have this value VI. If I give you twice as much stuff, you get, have twice as much value for that stuff. Right? But it's easy to imagine situations where this is not a sufficient model for what you're trying to understand. Imagine there's two goods. Okay, different goods, okay, A and B. And all I want to know is, like, do you, do you want A better or do you want B better? Okay. Already we're outside of the single parameter environment. Okay. It's not the case that you know, all, more, more stuff is all equal. Okay. You care which kind of stuff you get. So let me talk about general or so-called multi-parameter mechanism design. So we have n bidders as before. In the single parameter environment, it was sufficient. So we're again going to have a set of outcomes. But in the single parameter environment, all we cared about was how much stuff a bidder got. So outcomes without loss of generality were these n vectors, just saying how much stuff everybody got. No longer true. Okay. We're going to have a totally abstract set of outcomes. I'm going to assume it's finite.
And this could be anything. Okay, certainly need, you don't want to think about it anymore as n vectors, all right? At least not n vectors of numbers. So uh, we'll see more concrete examples as we go. For now, go ahead and just think of this as a single item auction, in which case the set omega would have n plus one different outcomes, corresponding to who won, if anybody. Okay, that's fine for now. So a bitter eye, now rather than having just one private valuation, has a separate private valuation for each possible outcome. And this again is a real number, and at least for today I'm going to be thinking of this as non-negative as well. So this is a general mechanism design environment. Now in the context of a single item auction, so even if, I, even if I take omega to be the n plus one outcomes about who won, if anybody, this is already a more general model. This is, no, this is already no longer a single parameter environment. We'll see more interesting examples later. The reason is that when we're thinking about single item auctions in the usual way, really a bidder was only allowed one opinion. Okay, which was how happy it was if it got the good, I, its value for the good. If it lost, if it didn't get the good, its value we just assumed was zero. Okay, so there are n outcomes, the ones in which I loses, where its value was assumed zero. Okay? No longer true with this formalism. Now, in principle, a bidder can have an opinion about each other person winning the good as well. Okay, so maybe the best case for me is I get it, that's 100. But if this person gets it, they're my friend, so I'm still pretty happy, 75. I don't like that person at all, so that's the worst case outcome. That, then, it's a, it, then it's a zero. Okay? So already is not that unreasonable, right? If you think about people bidding to acquire a startup or something like that, maybe you really want to acquire it. But you'd also much rather, if it's acquired by somebody else, you'd rather it be in a totally different market rather to, than to your direct competitor. Okay? But again, we'll see more examples as we go. So what I, want to, what I want to cover now is another sort of absolute cornerstone, absolute linchpin of mechanism design theory. And this is an old result. It's from the early 70s. And it's usually credited jointly to Vickery, Clark, and Groves. And what the VCG mechanism, this VCG theorem, tells us is that, well, there's at least one result from the single parameter world which extends to the multi-parameter world, even though it's totally general. And the result is that we can still do dominant strategy incentive compatible surplus maximization in every such environment. So we already know the special case of this result for single parameter environments. You'll recall that's, we had this exercise showing that the surplus maximizing allocation rule is monotone, and then we had Meyerson's lemma saying we can turn that into a DSIC mechanism. Okay? So this result we don't know, because we have never before thought about multi-parameter environments. Okay? All right. Also, for those of you that remember, the definition of an awesome auction. This has two of those three ingredients. Ingredient one was DSIC. Ingredient two was surplus maximization, assuming truthful bids. Conspicuously absent is that third property, polynomial time. Okay? And we knew we already had to lose that in single parameter environments. Think about knapsack. Think about a couple of the problems on the first problem set. So we certainly don't expect to have it here. In fact, we'll see that in some of the key applications, the VCG mechanism is, in fact, highly non-awesome. And I'll make that precise uh, in a little bit. Okay. 
All right, so the plan is the same plan we were, I was advocating for the single parameter problem, which is, I mean, as usual, so we're thinking about direct mechanisms in the same way. So we just get bids from players, we choose allocation, we choose payments, all of that's defined in exactly the same way. And we are again going to factor this design problem. We need allocations, we need payments, they need to be coupled. We're going to do it in two steps. First, we assume, without justification, that we have truthful bids and ask what would we do. And then we try to come up with suitable payments to get the DSIC property, thereby justifying our assumption <coughs> that bids are indeed equal to valuations. So let's assume truthful bids. So just, uh, again, no motivation yet. So I'm going to write these in, as vectors now, not as numbers. Why am I doing that? Why is B1 now a vector and not just a single number? What do I need to ask bidder one about? Each outcome. Yeah, each outcome, right? That, by assumption, that's the private information, OK? Bidder one could have any value for the various outcomes. I have no idea what they are. And I can't do any kind of sensible maximization unless I know. So I'm going to ask him, OK? So I get these bids, a vector of vectors. So BI indexed. Uh, capital Omega, and it's kind of obvious what the allocation rule has to be because the property that I want is, is already in the theorem, right? So just like before, we just set on a given bid vector, we assume they're the values, and under that assumption, we just output the outcome, which is surplus maximizing, okay? So step one, our hand is forced by what we want. Okay, so X, this is no longer a vector, necessarily. This is just some element of uh, capital omega. And surplus is defined in the usual way. We just sum over the bidders of their value. We don't know the value. We use bids as proxies. So among all of the possible outcomes, we just choose the one that maximizes the sum of the bids for that outcome. Okay? Only thing we can do. Now, step two, we need to define payments to get the DSIC constraint, OK? And this is exactly where I stopped at the end of lecture two. And then in lecture three, I gave you Meyerson's lemma, which implemented step two for the, all of the rest of the single, single parameter applications we ever saw. Because okay, that's what Meyerson's lemma did. So what you need is you need the allocation rule to be monotone, necessary and sufficient. And if it's monotone, then, by the way, here's the formula for the payments to get the DSIC property. Now, we're not in Kansas anymore. Multi-parameter problems. Okay? And so the issue, it's not obvious how to define monotonicity of an allocation rule anymore with these abstract outcomes. Okay, remember what did it mean in the single parameter setting? It meant if you bid more, you get more stuff. Okay, well, just, we just have to set omega. What does it mean to get more stuff? Okay. Similarly, it's not clear what it means to say a critical bid. That was our characterization of truthful payments for zero one problems. Right, it was just the smallest bid you could make and still get away with winning. We don't even really have a notion of winning anymore, right, with this abstract set omega. Okay, moreover, you know, you can consider false bids which are higher in one component and lower in another component. Okay, so the space of misreports is no longer one-dimensional, it's multi-dimensional. Okay? So, issue, definition of monotone, etc. not clear. That's where the single parameter paradigm starts to break down. Okay. Just for completeness, there is actually a notion of monotonicity, cyclic monotonicity, which is a necessary and sufficient characterization of the allocation rules which are implementable. Uh, and actually, mathematically, it's very pretty. It's basically isomorphic to the fact that a network uh, has well-defined shortest paths if and only if it has no negative cycle. So it's kind of a very cool theorem mathematically. 
But cyclic monotonicity is way less operational than monotonicity. It's just a brutal to verify. You can't figure out if an allocation will satisfy it or not. So it's never actually, it's almost never used to design mechanisms and prove that they're DSIC, unfortunately. Okay? So we're going to have to use a different approach, a direct approach. And here's what turns out to be the key idea. On um, one of your exercise sets, I asked you to prove uh, interpretation of what these critical bids are for surplus maximizing problems. It was sort of an English description of how you could interpret those critical bids. Does anyone remember what it was? Externalities. Good. Externalities. Okay. So one way you can think of the critical bid in a zero-one problem when you're doing surplus maximization is basically bidders pay for whatever surplus they take away from other bidders by virtue of their presence, by virtue of participating in the auction. And if you think about that English sentence, charge somebody for the surplus loss they inflict on the others, that actually totally makes sense in multi-parameter environments. Okay? So that actually way of thinking about payments, at least for surplus maximization, which is all we're trying to do right now, that seems like something that might generalize. So idea, charge bidder I, it's externality, and I'll give you the formula in a second. And again, what I mean by this is a bidder has to pay for the surplus loss it inflicts on others. And if you think about it, that is sort of a natural thing to try, right? We're trying to make this thing DSIC, so we're trying to get the bidders to do what we want. And we're trying to do what we want, which is surplus maximization. So hopefully by, you know, what do they care about? They care about themselves, and that's all. They care about how much value they have for an outcome. What do we care about the designer? We care about their value for an outcome and everyone else's. So somehow forcing the payment, forcing them via the payment to care about everybody else's value for the outcome, seems like it could work. And indeed, the so-called internalizing the externality is a, is a standard trick in, in economics. And it works here and in many other places. Okay, so what do I really mean by this? So again, we have our allocation rule, and I'm proposing now a payment rule. Okay? So the proposed rule, all right, so the surplus loss inflicted on everyone else. So first we say, well, how well would these other n minus 1 players, how well off would they be if i didn't exist, if we just ignored it when we maximized for surplus? Okay? So that means instead of solving this problem, suppose we solve this problem with i omitted. So this would be the surplus enjoyed by the other n minus 1 bidders if we did not consider i at all. On the other hand, with i, if omega star is the outcome chosen here, when we did consider i, then restricting just to the surplus enjoyed by the other bidders, it would just be the sum of their bids for the chosen outcome omega star. So this is with i, and this is where I'm using the notation omega star to be the outcome chosen by the mechanism on the particular bid. Okay. So this is precisely what I mean by the externality. So I've given you the, pay, the allocation rule, and I've proposed a payment rule. Okay? But we don't have any Meyerson's lemma guaranteeing that we have a DSIC property, so we're just going to have to check it from scratch. Okay? But once you've guessed the payment rule, checking it is usually not that difficult. So that's what we're going to do next. So claim this mechanism, and this mechanism is what's known as the VCG mechanism. I 
I claim that it's DSIC. And of course, by definition, it's surplus maximizer. Assuming truthful bids. Okay? But I, I owe you this, and then we're done with the theorem. All right. So proof of claim. So we're going to do something we haven't really done, I don't think, since we talked about the Vickery auction, which is prove DSIC from scratch. So we have to prove that no matter who you are, no matter what the other people are doing, your payoff, your utility, is maximized by setting your bid equal to your value. So let's fix who you are. I fix what everyone else is doing. B minus I. Okay. So I is trying to figure out what it should be. It's trying to compute the best BI. So if it chooses some bid BI leading to an outcome omega star, then, as usual, I's utility, we're in the same old quasi-linear model, so it's just its value for the outcome chosen minus the payment it has to make. Okay, so that's just by definition. So let's expand this using the proposed payment. So we have, uh, we have one term. So again, I'm going to expand this. So there's the value of I term. And then the payment term has two terms. Okay? And I'm going to collect this part, this second term, with the value term. And then this will be a, a second term. Okay? So just rewrite, expanding. Oh yeah, one of these is minus. This is minus. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right, so call this one. Call this two. So a wise person once said, do not worry about that which you cannot control. So have a look at the second term there. Have a look at two. So player I, right, what it gets to choose BI, and that's it. So what, what influence does uh, player I have over that second term? What is that second term a function of? All the other bidders, I should be able to connect. Yeah. So it only depends on BJs for J not equal to I. Okay? So that's just some number. Okay? 1,023. And it's, that, it's the same number no matter what bid player I selects. Okay? So player I wants to maximize this difference, 1 minus 2. But that reduces, that is equivalent to just maximizing 1, okay? Because it has no control over 2. Okay? It's not going to worry about it. So let's just focus on term 1. Think about that.
All right, so well, let's think about what's the best case. Now let's remember in term one, so this is where bitter I has some influence, okay? But let's remember the nature of its influence, okay? Bitter I cannot decide omega star the outcome directly. The mechanism gets to choose omega star. Okay? All bitter I can do is try to coax it into picking an attractive outcome bidding appropriately. How does the mechanism So let me just write it up here for scratch. So VCG chooses omega star to maximize what it believes to be the sum of the valuations. Okay, so don't forget. The mechanism is the one that gets to choose the outcome, omega star, and this is how it does it. This bitter I can choose B sub I. Of course, B sub I participates in this optimization problem, so bitter I can influence the outcome chosen, but only via its submitted bid BI. Okay? But let's just imagine, imagine I actually could pick the outcome directly. Okay? What would it do? Well, the best case for I, what the outcome it's rooting for is the outcome that makes one as big as possible. Okay, again, can't control two, so you want to make one as big as possible. Okay. So the best case for I is that the mechanism picks an outcome making one as big as possible. What's going to happen if I bids truthfully? What it wants to have happen happens, right? So if it sets right, so what does it what does it want to be optimized? What I wants to be maximized is its its value plus the sum of the other bids. And if it sets bi equal to vi, the mechanism by definition will maximize the sum of the bids. But that ith term then is equal to the vi. So this. Put another way, this objective function and the one that I cares about become the same when it fits truthfully. Okay? And that's really where you see this internalizing the externality. Okay? So the designer objective and the bidder objective actually become one. So setting bi equal to vi causes this to happen. Okay? So that's the VCG mechanism. And again, with the right intuition, the right approach, that externalities are a good bet, good first try for the payments, the proof actually isn't that hard. But this is uh, really one of the you know, most important uh, reference points in mechanism design theory. What was the question? How does picking, picking its valuation maximize the sum? It doesn't get to pick its valuation. It gets to pick its bid. Or, well, right. I mean, but, but like picking the bid to be evaluation, why is that? Because then what's in one, the objective function in one, becomes the same as the objective function that VCG maximizes. So the optimization problem that it would like to see solved from its perspective is exactly the one that the mechanism solves. Questions? All right. So I want to give you um, another way to think about these payments, which is sort of nice. Just as a sanity check, uh, uh, this internalizing the externality, notice 
all the way back to the Vickery auction, we saw this idea. Right? So we have this highest value bidder. If it didn't show up, who would win? The second highest bidder, okay? the second highest valuation bidder, with a valuation of V2. So by virtue of one showing up, it took the good away from that bidder. All right? And so that caused a surplus loss of V2 to the rest of the collective. Okay? And that's exactly its payment. So let me give you a, a different way to think about this payment, which is also useful. So let me just rewrite the payment. All I'm doing to the formula I had on the board before is adding and subtracting I's bid. Okay? I's bid evaluated on the chosen outcome. So if you do that, uh, another way to write exactly the same number is I can think of the payment as basically you pay what you bid, except they give you a rebate. I'll give you some back. Okay? So if you want, you could think about the Vickery auction as you pay what you bid, except I give you a rebate equal to the extent that your bid is higher than the second highest bid. Okay, I give you a rebate of V1 minus V2. So you can generalize that. So you pay your bid like in a first price style auction, but I'll give you some back. And what do you get back? Your rebate is the extent to which your presence increased the surplus in the environment. Okay? So again, like in a single item auction, if you're the highest value person, if you weren't there, the surplus would be V2. With you there, the surplus is V1, your highest valuation. So the surplus went up by V1 minus V2. And that's exactly the, the rebate I give you back after you pay your bid. Okay? And that's a general principle. So you pay less than your bid exactly the extent to which you increase the surplus. Okay. One of the reasons I want to mention um, these couple interpretations of payments is it makes it particularly transparent uh, why the payments have two properties that we want. Properties I'll ask you to verify in the next exercise set. First of all, the payments are always non-negative. This was never the case that the designer is paying the bidders. The bidders are always paying the designer, like in all the examples we saw. And it's going to be the case that truth-telling bidders have non-negative utility, which is equivalent to you never pay somebody, you never ask someone to pay more than what they bid for the outcome. Okay? So that's going to be easy given what I've told you in the past 10 minutes. All right, so what's the takeaway from all this VCG mechanism discussion? Well, the upshot is, is that, uh, you know, if we jettison all practical concerns, including computational tractability, then in principle, in insanely general abstract environments, we can still do surplus maximization with this extremely strong incentive guarantee, dominant strategy instead of compatibility. Okay? So upshot. In principle, can always do DSIC surplus maximization. No, that's one of the things that's uh, that's easy given. Uh, given the second, that's, in fact, that's the, one of the main reasons I talked about the alternative interpretation. Okay, and that's what dictates the possible term, the number two, right? Uh, yes. So the two doesn't have to be whatever we want. Good, excellent point. So let me, let me, let me summarize the, uh, the comment. Um, I may have erased what I needed. Yeah. Okay, so you'll recall that uh, in the middle of our proof, establishing, oh no, here it is. So the comment was, well, you know, our DSIC proof carries through no matter what the second expression 2 is. As long as it's independent of bitter I's bid. As long as bitter I can't influence it, it doesn't matter what that number is. Therefore, in particular, we could just add some arbitrary constant to bitter I's payment. 
Okay? And that wouldn't change the incentive compatibility properties. That, if you think about it, was actually true back in the single parameter case as well. I was just always normalizing things. So losing, this is back when we had a well-defined notion of losing, losing would give you a payment of zero. Or rather, bidding zero would give you a payment of zero. So the comment was, well, you could have anything else here. So why did we choose what we chose? And it, I mean, so there's a couple of reasons. One is just conceptually, the payments I just gave you have a number of nice interpretations. So they make good economic sense and are well motivated. But on a technical level, it's true that this constant is chosen just right. So the payments are guaranteed to be non-negative, that is from the bidders to the seller. But then also you have guaranteed non-negative utility uh, for truthful bidding. Okay? So it's sort of the sweet spot right between those two. Okay, but the fact that all of these happen in the same place is not an accident. Good comment. All right, so in principle, DSIC surplus maximization always an option. In practice, doing this can be really, really hard, okay? And to drive that point home, and also sort of segue into some more applications, I wanna introduce you to combinatorial auctions. So combinatorial auctions, the main difference between what we've been talking about so far is that there's multiple goods. Well, actually, we've talked about situations with multiple goods. But here, the multiple goods are not all the same. Okay? They can be different. And different bidders have different preferences for different goods. And they need not be consistent. Right? So in some sense, even in sponsored search, we had multiple goods. We had slot one. We had slot two. We had slot three. But the bidders all agreed on which was the best and which was the worst. The higher the slot, the better. So we could still shoehorn it into a single parameter environment. Now we're going to look at applications where you can't, where the goods are fundamentally different. Some bidders will like some more. Other bidders will like others more. So it's a little hard to know what to say about common control auctions. On the one hand, they're super important. Okay, they've generated uh, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars, if not more, through uh, dozens, if not hundreds, of auctions for selling off wireless spectrum over the past couple of decades. Uh, but they're extremely hard. They're very hard to do well. So for, in fact, they're pretty easy to do badly. One of the early spectrum auctions, this is in New Zealand, 1993. <laughs> Uh, the consultants projected uh, revenue of $250 million. They got $36 million. Okay, so they got like 13% of, uh, of, uh, of what they were expecting because of a poorly designed auction format. So Wednesday is when I'm really going to sort of drill down on you know, how do people solve these things, what, what, are, what are thought to be good and bad auction formats for actually doing this. But for the rest of this lecture, I just sort of want to introduce you to comptroll auctions and the reasons why they're so difficult. So end bidders, as usual, maybe think of these bidders as, you know, Verizon, AT&T, and a few different regional carriers. There's a set M, capital M, of M goods. And, you know, a few of these goods might be, you know, the same. But in general, these goods are different. Think of a good as being, you know, a right to broadcast at a given frequency in a given geographical area. Okay, so you, if you vary the frequency or you vary the area, you get a different good. Okay. So outcomes, so you know, the general mechanism design problems we just talked about, is, that's certainly general enough to discuss the problem of surplus maximization here. So the outcomes, they're gonna, we're going to go back to being n vectors, but there's not just one type of stuff. So each component of our n vector, we'll just say which goods, it's called the bundle, which bundle of goods does bitter I get? Okay.
Now, in principle, our formalism allows bidder I to have a valuation for every conceivable allocation of goods to the bidders. And there's a lot. If you think about it, the size of omega is quantity m plus 1 raised to the m. Okay, there's a lot of these things. But we're going to simplify it a little bit. We're going to assume that a bidder I only cares about the goods that it gets. We're not going to allow it to have an opinion about who, who gets what okay, of the other goods. So how many private parameters does a given bidder have in this model? Yeah, which we're calling little m. So 2 to the m, okay, 2 to the little m. We're allowing it to have a separate will maximum willingness to pay for each subset, each bundle of goods that it might get. Not as big as the number of allocations, which is m plus 1 raised to the m, but still an awful lot. Okay. Okay. So generally, one does impose some assumptions on these functions. It depends on the context. We'll talk more about this Wednesday. For now, let's just say, let's just normalize it. So your value for the empty set is 0. And we're, I'm going to assume something called free disposal, which means if I give you more goods, your value can only go up. Okay. The surplus objective can be simply expressed as maximizing over the bidders of their values for the bundles that they get. Okay? And of course, as you'd expect, each good can only go to one person. All right? So this is a special case of a general mechanism design environment. So the VCG mechanism applies. And in principle, we could use it to maximize surplus subject to dominant strategy and center compatibility. So uh, I don't really know of an example in the real world where anyone's ever done that when you have multiple kinds of goods. So maybe while I clear some real estate, you think about some reasons why you either couldn't or wouldn't run the VCG mechanism to maximize surplus in a non-trivial combinatorial option. There's not just one right answer to this question, I should say. So what do you think? Critiques? Why either couldn't or wouldn't you do that? Hmm? Might be too complicated for you to compute. Good. Right. So one thing we've discussed uh, already in the context of single parameter problems, so certainly we inherit it here is that even if you could get people to tell you all their private information and it was correct, surplus maximization could be empty hard. Okay? And so that can be intractable. What else? There's both, there's something else which is in some sense perhaps even more of a deal breaker and even more obvious. And then there's some things that are more subtle but also quite serious. Yeah. Good. So something that we never saw in a single parameter environment was just the difficulty of elicitation Right? So someone has 2 to the m private parameters. Right? So if m is 20, this is a million. Right? 
And even if you want to tell me truthful bids for all of your million valuations, I don't want to listen. Okay? I don't want to hear it. All right? But I mean, realistically, of course, bidders aren't willing to do this. It's, it's really the bidders that uh, you know, won't and can't do that. Okay? And again, that did not come up with a single parameter problem. But right? if you only have one number, of course, there's no complexity difficulty in just reporting it. Here, with so many parameters, there is. Okay, so this is even before we get to the point of computing anything. Just gathering the data is already infeasible. Okay, good. So those are the two that I wanted the class to come up with, just uh, off the top of their collective heads. So, all right, major challenges. And I'm going to do this sort of from most to sort of most obvious to least obvious, possibly. Maybe also most serious to least serious. Worthy of caps. So this is a complete non-starter in practice. I think this is the number one reason. I, I don't really know of people that have seriously considered running VCG auctions for a significant number of goods. Okay? I think this is where just you can't even get, uh, can't even get off the ground. All right? So, and it's not just about the VCG mechanism, notice. It's really about any direct revelation mechanism, VCG mechanism or not. Okay, so it's just hopeless to ask people for everything that they know. So an obvious approach then, and what is done, as we'll elaborate on on Wednesday, is you ask bidders for relevant information on a need-to-know basis. Okay? Now, we haven't talked about any auctions like that yet, but you're familiar with one. So you know, there's another implementation, in effect, of the sealed bid second price auction called the English auction, or an ascending auction. And this is what you've seen in the movies. Right, where there's an auctioneer, and people bid, and this price keeps going up and up and up, and people raise their hands. And what happens in one of these English auctions? The auctioneer keeps raising the price, and people you know, drop their hands. And when there's only one hand remaining, the auction terminates. That's the winner. And the price is whatever it was when the second to last hand dropped out. Okay? So just like in a second price auction, there's an obvious way to play in an English auction, which is as long as the current price is less than your value, stay in. Why not? You might win. But as soon as the price goes over your value, drop out. Because if you win, it's going to be at a price higher than your value, your utility will be negative. If all players play in that obvious way, then the outcome and selling price of this English auction is exactly the same as the second price auction. Okay? Highest valuation wins, charge the second highest valuation. Really, the Vickery auction is just the revelation principle applied to the English auction, if you want to think about it that way. Okay? So, you can do that even for a single item auction, even though in some sense you might want to, but you don't need to. Complexity considerations don't demand it. Here, with so many private pieces of information, it demands it. Okay, there's really no choice but to use some kind of so-called indirect mechanism. There's some bonuses. I mean, this is really the key reason. The key reason is that direct revelation is a non-starter. But there are some other bonuses of not using direct revelation. Maybe some of you wrote about this in your first exercise set, critiquing the revelation principle. But so, for example, sometimes people are worried about privacy. Okay? They don't want to tell the auctioneer all of their private information. Okay? Already this shows up in an English auction, right? Think about it. In a sealed bid, second price auction, you have to, if you report truthfully and you win, then the seller, the auctioneer, knows what your maximum willingness to pay really was because you wrote it down in an envelope and you gave it to them. What about an English auction? Suppose you win in an ascending English auction. Does the auctioneer learn the maximum you would have been willing to pay? What do they learn? Yeah, they learn a lower bound of what you'd be willing to pay, 
which is the second highest valuation. Okay, so if, you, if they sell it to you for 100 bucks, maybe you were right at your limit, maybe you would have paid 1,000, though none the wiser. Okay, so this is a second order reason why uh, you know, people also like non-direct mechanisms in this context. Although again, you know, it's, it's really just sort of gravy. Okay. So there's some really nice work in the theory community, which I've covered in sort of other versions of this course, which says that at least in the worst case, you cannot do any kind of, you cannot even get close to maximum surplus without eliciting an exponential amount of information. Okay, so in the worst case, this you know, exponential complexity doesn't go, on, go away, but as you'd expect, these iterative options do save you a lot, especially in practice. Okay? So that's point one. And then the other one that was raised, which is even when one is not a problem, so why would it not be a problem? Well, for example, if it's single parameter, then one is not a problem. It's easy to just reveal your private info. Then maximizing surplus can be NP hard. So this is something you already know well from previous discussion. And like with point number one, two is, if this isn't really a critique of the VCG mechanism. Neither of these are. It's really just pointing out how difficult you know, trying to solve these combinatorial auctions really is. So any mechanism, if it's going to run and if it's going to be computationally tractable, cannot maximize surplus exactly. And indeed, in practice, really there's no choice. You have to give up on exact surplus maximization. So people, in effect, are hoping that they're close to surplus maximization. It's a little hard to check if you think about it, because even after the fact, you don't actually know what people's values are. So how would you convince me that something is or is not surplus maximizing? But there is theory that's helpful here. It identifies conditions on valuations under which auctions will get you at least close to 100% surplus. Okay? But again, both of these two things, you know, full elicitation and full surplus have to be relaxed to get any kind of working implementation. All right, so here's the, here's the subtle point, which is even when neither one nor two is a deal breaker, You know, and maybe you're thinking, well, when would that ever be the case? But there are situations, right? So maybe you have single parameter bidders and you have a small problem. Okay, maybe you only have like 10 goods and 10 bidders, okay? And these are already non-trivial for people to implement. Then the computational problems, you can just solve them by brute force search or integer programming or what have you. Okay, so they're still empty complete, but complexity doesn't kick in. Let's say you're at small problem sizes. Even then, and now I'm gonna discuss a critique of the VCG mechanism itself rather than the problem fundamentally, the VCG mechanism can have some bad properties, can have bad revenue properties, can even have, despite the fact that it's DSIC, it can have weird incentive properties, which I'll elaborate on next. So we've sort of been talking about DSIC as a holy grail so far, and in many senses it is. But in this context, some more extra properties that you really want show up, and the VCG mechanism does not, in all contexts, have them. Let me give you an example. Let's just say two goods. Bidder one only wants both, okay? So this, you had a problem on problems at one, which was like this, okay? Where a bidder wants a set of items and it has no value if it gets a strict subset. So bidder one wants both, so that means its value for AB is one. And again, in the motivating application, think of one here as like a billion dollars and zero otherwise. And bidder two only wants good A. Okay, it's much easier to please. 
So V2 of AB is V2 of A, which is 1, and again, 0 otherwise. I'll leave it as an exercise for you to convince yourself that in this case, the VCG revenue is 1, which is also the same as the maximum possible surplus, which is great. Okay? So no issues with the VCG mechanism for this simple two-good, two-bidder case. It does exactly what you want, which is give, you know, it satisfies one of the bidders. It doesn't matter how you break the tie. And the winning bidder pays its full valuation, pays a billion dollars. Now, here's what's unsatisfying. What's going to be more than unsatisfying? Here's what's going to be a deal breaker. Suppose I add a bidder three. Okay, I make the uh, situation more competitive, it would seem. All right? Bidder three only wants good B. Okay, sort of the complement of bidder two. It only wants B. And again, its value for B is 1. So what's the new max surplus? 2. Right, so now, obviously the uh, high maintenance bidder, bidder 1, left out in the cold. We're going to give uh, good A to bidder 2 and good B to bidder 3, surplus of 2. Any guess? This isn't completely obvious, and I'll probably put it as an exercise. Uh, but does anyone see offhand what's going to be the revenue? The new revenue? So the surplus doubles to two. That's great. What happens to the VCG revenue? Be able to compute it in real time? It's not, it's not totally trivial. Does it stay at one? Does it stay at one? Zero. Why do you see that? What? Why? Because, like, I mean, just the second analogy for the how much do you pay is uh, revenue value minus the like, <coughs> like surplus you add to the world, and those can be canceled out later. Excellent point. So, if you use the second, uh, interpretation of ECG prices, where you pay your bid, but your rebate is how much you increase the surplus. Well, think about you know, bidder two or bidder three. It doesn't matter which. They're symmetric. Right? So before bidder three showed up, the surplus was one. Then bidder three shows up, and the surplus jumps to two, went up by one. So then what does it have to pay? Well, it has to pay its bid one minus the surplus increase it affected, which is one leaving you with zero. So that's the VCG revenue. Okay? Revenue drops zero. Right. And this is a new phenomenon we haven't seen yet. Okay, this did not happen in the single parameter problems we were talking about. You might want to just think about the Vickery auction as a quick exercise. Right? So imagine you have bidders with some valuations. The Vickery auction doing, is doing whatever it's doing. I had one new bidder with some valuation. The revenue can only go up. Right? Either nothing changes or this is the new highest bidder, and now the new revenue is the new second highest valuation, as opposed to the old second highest valuation. Okay. So this is a new twist, which is a, which is a you know, quite serious critique, actually, of the VCG mechanism for comptable auctions. And it's a critique, actually, in many senses. I'm sort of showing you the tip of the iceberg. Well, I guess there's two things that are you know, obvious here and, and really problematic. First of all, there's this seemingly competitive market, where you make literally zero money. Okay, and again, it's not that in these government auctions, the government's really trying to maximize revenue per se. Really, the first order goal is still surplus, typically. But usually, you have some kind of revenue considerations. And this, this is a problem. Secondly, it's just you don't, want a, you don't want a mechanism that has this non-monotonicity in the revenue. If new people show up, you want revenues to only go up. If that fails, like it does here, then there's all sorts of problems with collusion, with shill bids, and so on. Okay, and I'll ask you to explore this in the exercises. So this example leads to many incentive problems in the VCG mechanism. Okay. So final challenge. 
which again is something we, that just hasn't come up before. So we argued in our first point that direct revelation is absurd. So we have to interact with the bidders over rounds, like you do in an English auction, like you do in a sending auction. We really have no choice. And when you go beyond sealed bid auctions and allow rounds, interaction, especially with multiple goods, there are new opportunities for gaming the system. Let me give you an example. There is a study by Crampton and Schwartz about collusive bidding in the earliest FCC auctions. Okay? So as far as the history about how things like spectrum got allocated, right, so like obviously this was being done before wireless, you had to do it for television a long time ago and so on. So for a long time, it was this just purely political process, right? So there'd be some company, so it was given away for free, but by a just purely political process. So all the different big companies would hire all these lobbyists, and they'd you know, try to you know, sweet talk DC into sort of giving them some license for, for free. And uh, you know, that both, one, didn't seem that fair, and also just once you know, new technologies came out, it was just too onerous. There were just too many people who needed licenses to, to do it in this way. So they switched to awarding them for free by lottery. And these licenses, these are valuable licenses, and you could resell them, okay? So this was like a chance for, you know, a good for free that you could resell for millions of dollars. That didn't work so well, turned out. Actually led to some of the fragmentation in the spectrum, which maybe is one of the reasons why the US phone market to this day sort of lags behind certain other countries. So that didn't work very well. So in the, in the early 90s, they're like, okay, we need to have a smarter way to, to allocate these licenses. Um, and so that's when they started getting interested in auctions. And so this paper reports on some of the auctions that happened in you know, 94, 95. And so they talk about you know, various ways that bidders can collude when you have an auction that's indirect. Okay? So the FCC auctions they were discussing, I think they were in 94, what you did is you had a bunch of goods, and you can even think of them as being identical goods. They weren't, but for, for the story, you can think of them as being identical. And what you, would, what you did basically is you had, you, you ran in parallel, in the same room, if you like, ascending slash English auctions on all of them, okay? So each one had its own auctioneer and its own price, okay? And they, were, they could go up at different rates, so they could be at different prices at different times. Um, and, uh, and then at the end of the day, you know, the highest bidder on each good just won that good. Okay, so they're just sold separately using simultaneous ascending auctions. And one very cute hack that was used, so these bids are in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Okay, so, um, you know, if you bid 383,000 versus 383,172, you know, it's all the same to you, right? So that gives you these lower order digits, this bandwidth to communicate with the other bidders as the auction proceeds. Communicating before the auction, that would be illegal, right? But you can bid however you want to bid, right? So, you know, one example was there were these two, and this was sort of a not very competitive auction, which is why maybe the collusive bidding was, was sort of particularly effective. So um, there were these two regional characters, uh, uh, carriers, uh, U.S. West and McLeod, okay? And uh, U.S. West really wanted Rochester, Minnesota, okay? And um, Rochester, Minnesota, you know, it happened to be license number 378. And this annoying McLeod company kept battling with U.S. West for Rochester, Minnesota, right? So they go back and forth. Right, higher and higher bids each round, right? So U.S. West got annoyed with this competition over license 378, and so it chose a bunch of licenses it had no interest in at all, but that McLeod was f currently the high bidder 
And no one else was even fighting McLeod for these other ones. It just had a one, basically. But the auction was still open. And so U.S. West put a bunch of bids on these other licenses it didn't care about, which McLeod was holding. You know, bids of the form 172,000, what did I say it was? 378. Okay. And the other one, you know, whatever its current bid was, it would up it by 10 grand and tack on a, uh, you know, what was it? 378. So, you know, it was very clear signaling, stay out of 378, bub. And it worked. It worked. Very few bidders actually used at least detectable. So they were, I mean, the detectable collusion in this paper was very small. It was not many of the bidders. But the bidders who used it successfully got their licenses at what's thought to be a big discount, almost 2x. Okay? It was very effective. Now, there's a very easy fix for this particular problem, which is what? Just make the big increments big enough. All right? So you have to bid in increments of, say, 10,000, or whatever the appropriate unit is for the goods <laughs> that you're selling. All right? But, I mean, you know the game. Right? This, you know, who knows what else you could do? Okay? So the high-level point here is that we're forced to depart from the direct revelation world. We have to have auctions that are indirect, that interact with the bidders over time. And as a result, there's way more design decisions, way more opportunities for strategic behavior. So on Wednesday, I'll talk a little bit more about you know, what are the current auction formats, the cutting edge in these spectrum options. See you then. <laughs>